In the world of Hollywood, movies get greenlit and redlit. They get remade and rebooted. But we are the ideal. I'm Sam Gash, and you are listening to Ideal Remake. Thank you for listening to Ideal Remake. We take movies that either have been, will be, or should be remade and talk about what the ideal version of that remake would be. Today, we're watching The Avengers. No, not that Avengers, the one from 1998, with Sean Connery in a teddy bear suit. And my guest today is Chris Lord. So, Chris, is The Avengers a movie that has been, will be, or should be remade? Uh, Well, to your point, technically it has been remade, but also I think it should be, despite it being absolutely terrible. Yeah, I agree. Uh, before we get too far into this, Chris, thank you for returning. Uh, of you've, course. You've uh, been a guest on Ideal Remake before for our deep dives first into Superman, which was awesome, James Bond, which was awesome, and now we're doing the worst thing we've ever talked about. Oh, by a country mile. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, I'm one, I'm super excited to be back both times we did the previous episodes. It was incredibly fun. Um, and the, the funny thing is the last few times they were properties that I know very well. Like I know Superman really well. I'm, I'm a huge James Bond nut. So like I had spent years thinking about what a remake would be. Um, I basically know little to nothing about this version of the Avengers. The one that like started as a TV show in the sixties and then did the <laughs> 1998 remake. I, I vaguely recall seeing it probably on VHS after it came out because there's little things here and there that I recall, but I have not watched it since then. And now I understand for good reason guys this is one of the worst things i've seen in quite some time it's awful part of the reason we landed on this movie was because because of your great love of james bond i was like well we could do one of the two movies that made sean connery walk away from acting forever i and i this understand is one of them. why i completely yeah. understand why like it's the thing is this movie is only 90 minutes but i felt like i watched it for three hours <laughs> uh yeah yeah that that tracks and the thing is like it has the pieces of what could be a really interesting yeah. movie like it has eddie izzard in it oh. but he doesn't talk <laughs> eddie izzard is a comedian and is very funny and the only words he says are oh fuck right at the end uh and apparently it's not even him that's someone else doing the voice because they couldn't get what? him back yeah oh. <laughs> okay, okay. You take Eddie Izzard, one of the greatest comedians uh, around, and you take away the one thing that makes him work, which is his voice. (laughs) Ah, This movie's so weird. No, it is. It's completely nonsensical. And, like, I I know we're not doing a review of this, but I like to be informed about what I'm talking about. And so I I did a bunch of research, and I found, like, you know, little bits of trivia about alternate versions and what the the original cut of it would have been. And it fleshes things out a little bit more, makes it make a tiny bit more sense. But at the end of the day nothing could really make this movie make sense no amount of extra screen time could fix that problem yeah it's a problem (laughs) but like so the first time i watched this movie is i i just like figured out how to get hbo go from my parents and Mm -hmm. i was scrolling through it uh with my old roommate um who also has been a guest on this show zach luna we just like found this we found this movie called the avengers and we're like we don't know what this is this is weird let's watch it and we just sat on the couch and watched this insane thing. And we just like kept like, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent choice for a bad movie night yeah. because it is so bad that you get to have amazing fun. Just being like, what the shit is happening? Why is Sean Connery in a giant teddy bear suit? Are there <laughs> two Uma Thurman's? Why is his name mother? Uh, yeah, I think you were smart to watch it with somebody else. Like, I, I watched this. Um, we didn't know better. <laughs> I, I, no, I didn't know better. I watched this last night um by myself and i realized like you, yes you need someone with you to do, like to bounce ideas off of and to like i'm not crazy right this doesn't make any any sense whatsoever yeah that and what was a fun coincidence is like a week or two after we watched the movie it became the movie that was uh the ep, ep, the ep, that episode of uh how did this get made oh, which is a okay. movie that which i meant to go back and re-listen to that episode but then i forgot I forgot um, they did this too. I mean, they're yeah. they're always so spot on. Um, and they, maybe they could have brought some joy out of this because otherwise, it's it's a dreadful affair. And it's so rare that I've actually seen one of the movies they're talking about that I, for me to mm-hmm. actually be like, "Oh yeah, good take, well what? done, Jason Manzukis." Oh wait, I love I love me some Manzukis. But you can kind of see where 
the logic was on this. Like, you can see why it would have been a good property to pick because so many, like, 60s TV shows were being remade around that time. I mean, yep. you have, like, Ray Fiennes when he's, he's so young in this. Yeah. He looks so, it's it weirded me out actually seeing so young. We've got him, you got Uma Thurman, you eventually get Sean Connery on board, like, Eddie Izzard. Like, you can kind of see the DNA there, but I don't think anyone knew what they were doing. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things happening, but tonally it's off. Like, they keep being attacked, and, and Ray Fiennes keeps being like, I'm fine. I'm just going to walk away from this. <laughs> oh, yeah, this, this British it's, nonchalance. Yeah, I would describe the entire tone of this movie as nonplussed. Yeah, I'd agree. Oh, the uh, the tornadoes in London? Uh, well, I suppose we should get to work then. I it's, honestly... It's I so British. Want, I now kind of want to see a supercut of uh, someone take this and just every time Ray Fiennes is supposed to say something, they just replace it with Winnie the Pooh saying, oh, bother. <laughs> I feel like yeah. it's about the same emotional tone. Uh, I'm now Googling something because I want to make sure I'm talking. We're saying Ray Fiennes, isn't it? Not Ralph Fiennes? It's pronounced Rafe. Well, I'm learning things. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the funny things is one of the last episodes I recorded in person was another Ray Fiennes uh, movie, mm -hmm. but it's another one that's like near impossible to find called Strange Days. Oh, I may have heard of this. And it's, I, it's a movie with a massive trigger warning, so I don't necessarily recommend it, but it's, okay. he doesn't look like Ray Fiennes. Oh, you know, he does not. He... He looks like uh, uh, Bradley Cooper in the movie, and it weirded me out the entire time. Yeah, or he, he kind of looks like the sleazy guy Ellis from Die Hard a little bit. Oh, or, yeah, that, totally. <laughs> if you want to go for the most obscure reference possible. <laughs> right. Like, ah, look, it, it takes a lot to be able to pull off a bowler hat. I get that. But mm -hmm. also, why? <laughs> but anyway, so this is a strange movie, and... Mm -hmm. um, what are we going to do with this thing? So I I went into this, not having seen a long time, thinking, okay, like, British spy TV show, so we just kind of got to do something similar-ish with, like, what we talked about James Bond. I feel like we're covering kind of similar territory. And then I watched it, and I was like, what the hell do we do with this? <laughs> because if you, if you think about trying to do a, like, a little bit more straight down the line version of this with maybe like a little bit of tongue in cheek you just get kingsman yeah that's true i intentionally tried to avoid kingsman casting yeah same because you you get like you know you have a, a main character who is you know very british is wearing the suit the hat the you know umbrella is his signature weapon um you know he has some sort of connection to a tailor i think i, I think that happened in the movie i can't keep track of any of this stuff um, but you know, he did like, have a weird scene where he ordered boots yeah. <laughs> and it turns out those boots had a tracker in them. Yeah, I know. I guess. You, you feel like they could have done more with the boots than just put a tracker in them. Yeah. I was expecting some sort of like James Bondian gadget. Yeah. I, I, I kept expecting the hat to have a gadget or the, like the umbrella. And it just turns out it's an umbrella sword later. Exactly. That's the only thing about it. Exactly. I was expecting like more like more gadgetry and you know, it, it is kind of like a little bit wry and tongue in cheek. Um, but I felt like there was no way to do a kind of a, a more quote unquote like traditional adaptation without just treading over Kingsman. So then I started doing research on the 1960s TV show to get a sense of like, okay, how close was the movie to the show? Turns out the show, once it kind of got into its groove, really leaned into like what's called the um, the spy-fi genre. So the show did a lot of stuff with like robots and like alien carnivorous plants and weird stuff like that. So I, I don't know if there were ever people are sitting around a table in teddy bear costumes. That might be a particularly odd thing about this one. But the the idea of like a weather machine and like some maniacal scientist that was there. So I kind of felt like we still had to find a way to incorporate that in some capacity. Yeah. And I honestly think that I do think the movie as it exists now has all the pieces of a really good spy movie. Yeah. But I honestly think it's out of order. Yes. Like the way, like I honestly think it even has the basis of a good act one, act two, act three structure in the sense that like we have our escalating villains. Mm -hmm. We have our Eddie Izzard bruiser bad guy who then escalates to the Sean Connery we think is the big bad. 
and then escalates to turns out there's been an inside mole this whole time. And that's the big surprising uh, middle of the movie reveal Mm -hmm. that the big bad is working with this, with uh, this traitor. And that's the escalation that the movie should have been building towards. Instead, it opens with (sighs) Sean Connery. Then we get Eddie Izzard. And then Eddie Izzard just like kind of like needles them sporadically. Mm -hmm. The weird Uma Thurman clone also is there sometimes, but sometimes not. Uh, Tuma Thurman. Perfect. (laughs) Perfect. I got nothing. That's wonderful. And and then all of a sudden we just get, oh yeah, it turns out father's evil. Oh. Oh. Well, I'll have another macaron then. (laughs) Macaroon. Yeah, I, no, I would agree with that. Like, it, it does feel very thoroughly chopped up um, and just completely rearranged in a, an absolutely nonsensical way. Like The teddy bear thing even would work really well if you then later reveal that one of the people in the teddy bear costumes was Father. Oh, that would make more sense. Yeah. Like, you have this amazing thing where he's like, we don't know who any of you are, but I do. Cool, was this going to come back? No. Nope. It's just weird for weirdness sake. Teddy bear costumes. The movie is so nonsensical that I, I literally remembered two things about it when I saw it as a kid. So I probably saw it when I was like either nine or ten after it came out. One was the um, the scene where they walk across the like the pond in the bubbles, which like from a visual standpoint kind of works. They just don't do yeah. it very well. But, like that's actually a pretty cool imagery, and it's very sixties can make can make it work. I remember mm-hmm. that, and I remember at one point. Sean Connery playing the organ and above him is a picture of Uma Thurman and they never explained that. As like at 10 years old, I remember that one thing about them not paying off this weird moment. I I will give this movie credit of being able to cast Sean Connery to literally just play Sean Connery. Oh yeah. Because he was one creepy ass rapey motherfucker. Oh, Sean Connery is a horrible human being. Yes. And just like, I legitimately felt bad for Uma Thurman in the scenes because it genuinely felt like, oh, you're Sean Connery. You're going to rape Uma Thurman now. And I was like, this isn't a good scene. This is a bad scene. No, it, it it's was, all, it's all such a mess. Cause um, he was the wet, he was the weather guy who was obsessed with the weather lady. So he had the weather lady cloned. Yeah. We never really figured out why they bothered having her clone. We had this amazing opportunity for a bizarro, but no, no. Yeah. And she just doesn't talk to the entire thing. It, like the little bits and pieces that I read uh, help flesh it out a little bit. Like, so I'm trying to remember exactly how it works, but like Uma Thurman's character, uh, Mrs. Peel worked on this project called Prospero, which was designed to control weather. And at some point her husband died and then she was no longer in the project. And I guess, Sean Connery was involved with the project and then took it over. I don't know. Like at one point there was a, whole, there's that one sequence we see like over CCTV footage of her breaking into the place and like mm-hmm. trashing a lot. Originally that was the opening of the film was like the set of this, like this big shocking moment of like, well, we expect our hero is this villain going around like killing people and stealing stuff. And that would have, I guess made a little bit more sense as to why we meet her again down the line. But then also why the hell would the, the secret government organization just trust the person that they have on camera killing people and stealing their thing to then go solve the mystery of it. Didn't I, I get mean, any of that. mother said the line, well, she's our prime suspect. So either she confirms her guilt or helps us solve the crime or, or escapes yes. or gets away or, or kills your hero. Like, yeah, she could do anything at any point. I mean, ah, oh, mother is so incompetent. I am, it, it makes total sense that father would want to be like, yeah, no, no, I'm not gonna. It's like the epitome of uh, of male privilege of this incompetent buffoon rising to the top. Yeah, it it, it does seem fitting that eventually Fiona Shaw, who plays uh, father in this, worth noting that like the their titles are gender swap. So father, who's the villain in this, but clearly the more competent of the two, eventually got a chance to go off and play like one of the heads of MIA. Five MI6 in uh, Killing Eve. Like, I'm glad that, like, Fiona Shaw got her, <laughs> like, spy redemption moment. She's great in that show. But also love they cast Jim Broadbent as, like, the totally hapless head of the department because if you need hapless in British, you cast Jim Broadbent. Sure. Here's a question because I feel like they opened with this and then didn't do that. Mm-hmm. Is Father blind? 
because it certainly seems that way when she first walks out and then later she's just like reading stuff and and moving around levers and dials I'm so it's like sh- was she pretending to be blind I think the character is supposed to be blind because one of the things I write about the 60s TV show was that the character, either that exact character, or the character that uh, Father is based off of, had like super hearing or something like that, and having to do with blindness and a sort of like Daredevil esque sort of thing. So I, I think the character is supposed to be blind. I just don't think they knew what they were doing, and so they're just like, "Well, we need to have this person be in the scene, so who cares if they can see or not?" Yeah, I I got nothing. No, it, ah. it's 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 such a mess. But so I, I'm curious, like for you coming out of this movie, as you were thinking about how to remake it, like what what tone were you trying to nail? Because like that was the hardest thing for me to figure out. For me, it's about it, it's the sci-fi spy. Okay. That's what you said, the spy-fi. Yeah, and that that makes sense to me. Like you have this big weather contraption, and it's mm-hmm. a movie that like even in the begin that first scene when you're watching Ray Fiennes like go through the like the training sequence and everyone's like turning on him and then you think the nuns are going to but they don't (laughs) and it's this cool little fight sequence sort of and then you realize it's a training thing and it's like were those live rounds we don't know (laughs) and and then we meet his tech guy who goes great job and he leaves Mm -hmm. like we meet the q and then q does nothing nope for me it's all about just like in that scene, you could do just like an escalation of sci-fi. And for me, I think that's kind of what the movie itself could be. Mm-hmm. Of You have just like this basic, this is how science, like, this is how government involvement in sciences or turning science into, it, it, into we- weaponizing science can get blown out of proportion. And like, here's just the examples of just all of a sudden ramping up. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. While also, look at Uma Thurman in this dress, I guess. <laughs> like, I, I, yeah. like, I get it. Uma Thurman's very attractive, but I think she's in a different outfit in literally every scene. I think so, yeah. Like, she does a full costume change in the span of, like, ten minutes to go see a different person. Yeah, and then you also have this... I just remembered this scene. Is Sean Connery's house magic? Oh, yeah, like the M.C. Escher, like, Scooby-Doo yeah. style thing, I, I guess. Which was a cool thing, because literally Uma Thurman goes down a spiral staircase and ends where she began. Like, it was a cool camera shot. Yeah. And I was trying to figure out how they did it. And how I think they did it is they just painted the floor. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, Ooh, Because it was just straight top down. But I don't, I don't know. It was cool, though. And, like, like I love weird things like that and just what you're seeing isn't necessarily what's happening. Yeah. I, Cause I agree. Like there it's weirdness is intriguing, but to the point of being nonsensical, I think that's where it falls apart. Like you can do weird and outlandish and bizarre, but you have to have like some loose in universe, like justification for it just to maintain cohesion and, and logic. Yeah. And tone. And as I was trying to figure out, like, how do you approach a remake on this? Uh, the the movie that I settled on as a comparison would actually be the first Men in Black. Oh, okay. I can see that. Because, like, that it, movie, it's, it's weird, but it lets itself be fun in its weirdness. But it also takes its own premise, like, seriously while still being yeah. playful. They're having fun, but they're dealing with serious things. So it's yeah. not, a, like, a, it's not a meta-commentary it's people who are able to have fun despite the fact that they're going through something insane. Yeah. You know, it's like, I can, you, I think, I think that's a good comp. Yeah. Like you think about Tommy Lee Jones and that is, um, you know, fairly non plus through most of it, but that doesn't mean that he's not reactive. And I think that's what this movie went too far. It's like, it's the point of there's no reaction to anything, but I like yeah. that idea of like your, your main character being so used to this stuff that he is primarily unflappable, but I think you maybe need to give a, a, a moment of flap or, you need to have his scene partner, in this case, Uma Thurman, play off of that in some sort of sense. Like, you need to have an audience entry point into the movie. And that's what Men in Black does such a good job with, is that it, you know, puts us in Will Smith's shoes. So, although he's super gung-ho to be a part of this organization, and he's, like, you know, naive and ambitious, we understand where he's coming from. And when he discovers things, we discover things. And we're reacting the way he's reacting. Compared to Uma Thurman, who's, like, challenging Ray Fiennes to be whoever can emote the least yeah (laughs) which makes it a bit challenging to be invested in it it's like they're both 
just living life on the runway. Yeah. I think, yeah, I completely agree. Cause like you have the, <laughs> you have Tommy Lee Jones upside down in the car singing along with Elvis. Mm-hmm. And then you also having him like shouting that the earth is always going to be in danger. And the only way these little people can get on with their miserable lives is if they do not know about it. Yeah. And you get to have this amazing split. That is such a good comparison. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and you feel like maybe this movie had that idea in mind, but really screwed the pooch on it. Well, it came out a couple of years after Men in Black. Men in Black is what, 1996? Uh, I think somewhere around there. Yeah. So you, you can see that maybe even in the pitch meeting for this original film, like possibly trying to use that as a comp, but then not really getting it. I, it came out the year before. So Men in Black came out in 1997, oh, okay. and then this movie came out in 1998. So it's the sort of thing where like, by the time Men in... Well, you know what? I could see Men in Black coming out and then that influencing the movie they were already in the process of making. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. They should Based have on nothing, but sure, why not? Yeah, exactly. Sure. Let's have Sean Connery get struck by lightning and then raised up into the <laughs> sky. Because that's how lightning works. Didn't you know that? It's, it's like God's oh, finger totally. just plucking people up off the land. <laughs> This this movie as well as so I have a weird schedule in that I'm recording three episodes like I'm recording an episode today tomorrow and Saturday. Oh wow! I'm very I'm gonna be very tired. Yes. Um, but this movie and the one I'm talking about on Saturday, it's like the characters themselves are doing a lot of things, but they're not the reason a lot of things are happening. Yeah, like stuff keeps happening around it. Like uh, Uma Thurman broke one of the cords off on the on the escape hot air balloon. And was that the reason it crashed? Cause it felt like it crashed for some unknown reason. Maybe. Cause also she jumped out, landed in snow and was fine. Yeah. And then the other two didn't do that and died in it. Some sort of explosion. Yeah. And then like weird clone Uma Thurman seemed to both resp- uh, respond to Sean Connery and father. Like I didn't know who she worked for. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I gave up trying to make sense of this. I gave up trying to follow the plot or to make sense of it. I, I was just trying, like my, my notes were mostly just about tone and moments Fair. and stuff okay. like that, because like try, trying to like re redo the plot to me was like out the window. And if anything, yeah, no, you're right, I you're haven't right. figured out in terms of a remake is what like the main plot or main villain would be. Because I was just trying to crack how to make this and not make it seem completely buffoonish. Um, but yeah, I, I gave up. I think that we can kind of keep some of the, the aspects because I legitimately do think that we can start with we have this suspect and we're pretty sure it's her, but we also have evidence that she was this in this other place. So mm-hmm. it both has to be her and cannot be her. Okay. But the science that's being dealt with and that was stolen is something that only she will understand. So unfortunately, we have to trust her because if not, we're boned anyway. Yeah, I, I think that aspect works. Like, <clears throat> I think positioning her as some sort of expert in whatever field it involves in some sort of like scientific endeavor makes a lot of sense. Um, I would definitely remove the the clone Tuma Thurman thing just because to me that just was yeah. so confusing, and I, I think it makes it almost a little bit too silly. But there is something to be said about. Um, not knowing whether they can trust her or not, which I also think would work well because I feel like the success of any version of this should ultimately rely on the chemistry of the two leads. Like yes. more than anything else. I feel like that's what we remember from the 60s TV show. And I, I honestly just didn't really feel the chemistry here. Like, no. <laughs> I, I, I was, watching this made me forget that Uma Thurman's a good actress. <laughs> like I, she's a really I mean, good actress, but like you compare, the, you think about this and Batman and Robin, you're like, ooh. Oof. This was Oof. this was a movie that cast on profile alone. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And like she looks good in that cat suit. <laughs> I but... meant uh <laughs> Oh, you meant I meant both of them. An actor. Like <laughs> like no, like literally like look at them on the side and Uma Thurman and Ray Fiennes like standing next to each other they're like, yeah, like just like their shadow against a wall. Yeah, just, You're like, "Oh yeah." Just from the silhouette, that's alone all you need. But what what was really funny to me was that Uma Thurman with the red hair in the cat suit in Avengers is basically uh, uh, Black Widow. Oh yeah. It's a good point. It's very and true. I wanted to come up with some sort of joke or pun for that, but I feel like just explaining it that right now, like I had to is the only way you can do that. I, Cause it's I, so ridiculous. 
I also feel like this movie is so bad that it, it almost to some degree kills the ability to make fun of it. I agree. <laughs> that said, I'm still going to take a picture of Sean Connery in a teddy bear suit because fuck that guy and it's hilarious. <laughs> That's absolutely true. That said, if I get the opportunity to wear one of those giant teddy bear suits, I'm doing it. Oh, you have to. Yeah, to, those those looked great. <laughs> yes. But okay, so that's where I would kind of start. I would start yeah. with some sort of science thing gets stolen. And yeah. I think it should turn out to be uh the character's name was Bailey, the Eddie Izzard character Bailey who steals it. Mhm. And so they end up having to go and figure out that it's this that it's this guy. Okay. But that and that kind of takes the course of act 1. We're learning to trust each other, we're getting in the way and this guy sends his robot wasps after us. <laughs> Whatever it is, we get through it together and we find out when we finally stop him that he was in fact working for this greater villain. Mhm. And that's our act two of now going to track down this greater villain who now has this science thing and is able to complete his evil doomsday weather machine, whatever. It could be weather, it can be something else, I don't care. Yeah. And the the villains keep getting tipped off as to what the heroes are going to do. Like the villain keeps having this insider information and uh... all their tricks and surprises don't work. And they have this amazing plan to take it down because dr mrs peel knows the science and knows like just what to do to take down this machinery but it doesn't work because they were prepared for it because then we find out that father was the traitor inside the whole time and now we have these two running villains of the big bad sean connery and father at the same time trying to take over and be like i i've been second fiddle for so long why don't I just jump to the front of the class and take over everything? I, I like that. Yeah. I think that would help a lot, given it a more kind of little bit more linear, traditional storyline. Cause I feel like mm-hmm. if you're going to do a universe, that's going to be really kind of over the top spy fi science fiction sort of stuff. It helps if you give it a more grounded plot thread. Yeah. You kind of like work your way through it. I think that works. Yeah. You like have the henchmen, you just escalation. I like that idea too, of the, 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 big bad in the Sean Connery form going up against the mole on the inside and then like kind of battling out who's the, the bigger bad. And also the idea that if there's a, a, a mole present and they possibly suspect that Mrs. Peel is the traitor all the way through, I think that gives it a nice dynamic about, you know, the two of them finding a camaraderie with each other and like a, you know, a, a repartee and liking each other as people, mm-hmm. but the trust isn't quite there all the way through. And I think that that friction would work well in terms of that dynamic. Yeah. And I think the dynamic should be that, uh, first of all, Steed and Peel are two similar names. Um, but John Steed, I think he needs to be like the the diplomat and the spy and the one who like knows how to get in places. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the, the Emma Peel needs to be the science person. So they both are the expert in something and the novice in something else instead yeah. of them both being Mary Sue's who are good at everything. <laughs> my god you're so right this movie's just there's just a bag of mary sue's all the way and through so like they both need to have opportunities to both be right and then be wrong be right and be like and like yeah. have this dynamic because they both fulfill aspects of skill sets that the other one simply doesn't have yeah like i the my choice for uh mrs peel is very charismatic but and can be a people person but also can be like brusque Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm using the right word there, but th- like that's oh, sort yeah, of idea. I what you're saying, yeah. And so like that's kind of that's kind of what I want. Like, why would a like because even in James Bond, Bond isn't the tech guy, and no. Q doesn't go on me- missions with him. So even in our James Bond remake, we need a James Bond person with him to be the tech expert. And mm-hmm. like, I'm only realizing it now as I'm saying the sentence that I'm stealing from what we've already done, but let's do that same thing again. Cause that's what works. Let's just do it again. Yeah. If it works, it yeah. works. Yeah. No, I, I think that we already I, made the perfect bond movie and yeah. this is now that movie, but with jokes, we're just ripping off ourselves. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I, cause I saw, cause I was trying to figure out how to do a character like John Steed now. And, and it's worth acknowledging that for like I would do this as a contemporary story. So I, I kind of went back yeah, and forth. Absolutely. Like, do, do we do it back in the sixties, try and make things simpler? But I realized like that's been done a lot of ways too. So I, and I think you can do something interesting now by setting it in contemporary times. It's a contemporary story, but like you have this character that 
is very anachronistic. Like, even like at this day, really, to be fair, I don't live in the UK, but my understanding is not a lot of people walk around in like full suits and bowler hats and umbrellas. Like, it's a very old fashioned thing. And based on my reading about the TV show, that was actually an issue they had when making the show. So we see a little bit of it in this movie where like they go to all these really popular locations around London, but they're all empty. And I guess the old TV show did that too. And someone once said like, hey, don't you like pay extras? And the problem they had was as soon as you put John Steed in, at the time, even a contemporary surrounding of normal people, he stands like a sore thumb. Because like even in the 60s, that look was old and outdated. But you obviously, like, that is a staple. You have to bring that in here now. And so I was trying to figure out how to make that work. And then I think what I ultimately stumbled upon was, you know, this is a guy who probably works for, like, a, I think in this version, works for a branch of the, you know, the espionage divisions, like the ministry, whatever you want to call it, that specializes in kind of like the men in black, not necessarily in aliens, but in, like, weird high-tech out there situations, right? Like, right. The, sort, the sort of stuff that you can't train like a James Bond or like any of those sort of people because they're used to dealing with like normal sort of stuff. Like this is the really crazy, like super heightened sci-fi stuff that, you know, you read about in tabloids and like, you know, National Enquirer and shit like that, but doesn't ever seem to be real. Kind of like the Men in Black. And so what I realized is the way to approach his character is that he cho- chooses to dress that way to be deliberately perceived as a kook. Like he's mm. an expert. He really knows his shit, but his expertise is in things that no one else thinks is real or plausible. And so by dressing that way, when he interacts with people, they just automatically write him off. And so he has the power of everyone underestimating him all the way through. Like he's actually very polished and very capable and he conveys himself that way, but no one takes him seriously just because of the way he directs. And he, he has this sort of like old fashioned anachronistic approach to things. Um, just as a way to kind of like justify the way that works. But I also think that kind of makes sense about him being this really um, capable character in a very, very niche world, which I feel like this movie would have to be ultimately set in this really niche, bizarre space. Yeah. It feels like the world itself needs to be heightened in the same way. It our world, but heightened. Yeah. Well, like a level of heightened, even beyond like, you know, Kingsman is, like a little bit heightened, right? Mm-hmm. To me, this would be like I, I keep going back to the kind of a little bit more Men in Black, like stuff that you don't yeah. think is real is real, like robots. And like, there's that random moment in this where someone's invisible. Like, you know, you almost <laughs> have to like play that up a little bit. You almost have to have that moment where Steed and Peel go through the headquarters, and there is like, you know, a, an invisible person or a robot, or even you could do clones. Like, you could literally have like one guy who's been cloned a shit a lot of times. And he does a whole bunch of administrative stuff. And the explanation is like, oh, yeah, like, you know, he was the, a, a test subject of some mad villain. And, you know, we let him come work for us so that he didn't have to try and, like, you know, hide sort of thing or explain why there's a whole bunch of them. You could have, like, that sort of stuff, like, you know, that moment, like, in Men in Black, where you walk into the building, it's full of aliens, that sort of stuff. But all the crazy stuff that you wouldn't think exists in the real world. Yeah, I like that. I also kind of like the idea of them having to go out and do investigation and be in the real world. And you could honestly have the running joke of, steed and peel showing up in random places dressed to the nines as they are and like some random passerby is like what are you spies or something no move on yeah all right and like you could literally do that three times in the movie because like they're you're right they're gonna stick out like sore thumbs yeah they're deliberately conspicuous and thus dismissed correct yeah because you just like this this, you're not like you're not if you were a spy you would hide you would yeah. like, try and blend in. You would be inconspicuous. The best spy in this movie is Alice. Yes, the, actually. The old she woman. Is. Yeah. Because yeah. when she shows up in the middle of the road and just holds out a hand to get the car to come to a screeching stop, I'm like, what is this lunatic here to do? What is this crazy old white lady about? About Because what's happening with her? Yeah. And then she pulls out a Tommy gun and like t- <laughs> nearly takes out Bailey. And I'm like, oh, shit. Best character in the movie. And yeah. I stand by that. She is the best character in the movie. I don't disagree. And I don't know. I just think that'll be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you can have Alice-like characters interspersed throughout this world. Well, especially be- and especially because you kind of do that at the beginning. You have the stick out like a sore thumb, like blending in by standing out. And that's your two leads. But that's one type of spy. And then you can have the other type of spy everywhere else. Who's like, these nut jobs. 
Yeah. But they're like the ones who keep getting the work done. Yeah, you could. Or like Will Smith who shows up at the end with his Matrix style like yeah. outfit. <laughs> yes. Oh, and his like, uh, instead of having a tie, it's with like that, that button collar thing going on. Was, like, <laughs> yeah, which is so weird. Years, which is just terrible, terrible design choice. It's, uh, we're going to be futury. So it's retro futury. That's the future, right? Mm, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, uh, oh man, look at all these hoops. Hoops are cool. Hoops aren't cool. Then why are you wearing them? Because they're not cool. Yeah, exactly. I'm just going just gonna to quote Futurama as much as I can. Oh, always. But yeah, so what are some important set pieces that you think we need to hold on to? Um, uh, do you want to have the weather machine or do you want it to be something else? I I couldn't think of a a science MacGuffin other than that I would want it to be a science MacGuffin of some kind. Sure. Like if there is weird outlandish stuff, I want it to have like a loose base in some sort of science. And so it could be a weather machine. It could be... I don't know, robots. It, it could be something, but it has to feel kind of grounded. Um, There's a couple things that we could use that are already planted in the movie. One of them is the weather machine. The other one is cloning technology. Like yeah. it could be going out and replacing all the world leaders with clones that you control. And that's how you take over the world. Oh, kind of like Manchurian Candidate? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but oh, that could be interesting. I mean, they, the movie already introduces the concept of like a functioning clone that they like grew in a lab yeah. and have complete control over. That could also be a doomsday scenario. I, I guess I was steering clear of the cloning thing because I think this movie does such a ham-fisted job with it. That I don't disagree, but I'm presenting it as another option. No, yeah, and I because I, I, I did consider that, and I ultimately realized, like, I think it'd be fun to throw that in there as, like, a reference, almost kind of acknowledge, like, oh, yeah, like, the last movie kind of did this and did a really bad job with it, so we're kind of including it but kind of poking fun at it. I think if you make mm-hmm. it the centerpiece of the movie again, um, it's going to feel a little bit too similar. So yeah, I I didn't have a MacGuffin other than I just said like science MacGuffin. Okay, I have another one that I can give you that that is kind of fun mm-hmm. and uh, gets to stick with a little bit of a Vonnegut theme of hmm. and, and the snowy theme of what if the MacGuffin is Ice Nine? Oh, that's Cat's Cradle, right? I think you know, so. Is it? It's the only Vonnegut book I've read, but I'm trying to remember what was Ice Nine exactly. It's been about it's, 15 years since I've read it. it it's some material that when you drop it in water, all that water freezes. Oh, but, but that's right. Yeah. All that water freezes. So the yeah. unfortunate thing is someone dropped it in the ocean and the entire ocean froze. That's right. Yeah. And that yeah. that was the apocalypse of that book. It's like life went on, but not really. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, it's super duper dangerous. I and like so that like idea. that, but on a smaller scale. Yeah. I think something like that would be cool. Yeah. And it's it's a super small, easily dismissible thing that can be stolen, it can be duplicated, whatever. But it's also something that, like, just this tiny little thing has massive uh, implications. Mm-hmm. And also, you get to see it go off in smaller places. And I don't think it should be, like, the entire ocean would freeze, but, like, it'll, it'll go for a while. Yeah. Like, it would take out the entire irrigation system in a city. It would... Venice would just be done. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah, you could see someone like threatening to like deploy it into the, the water system in the UK. And if you go with that, you also have the added bonus of getting to have the uh the global warming argument of I mean at the end of the day, I'm going to end up doing this anyway because the temp the Earth's temperature is rising and we need to figure out a way to cool it down. I figured out a way to cool it down and yeah. to eliminate humanity, which is making it go up in the process. So that way you get to have that little bit element of them being right. So that way you get to make the Sean Connery, the environmental terrorist yeah. and father, just the person who wants power. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, and so, and then what other little toys and things do you think we should keep? Cause I actually like them walking over water in the bubbles. I that was a blink. It was a blink yeah. and you miss it moment, but it was a really cool like tableau. Uh, yeah, I would want to keep that if possible. I think it's the coolest image in the whole thing. And they, they don't even do a good job in the movie of using that image. Mm-mm. Like, it's really hazy because it's, like, seen over a CCTV and the bubbles are clearly CGI. Yeah. Um, yeah and then but, they open the entire thing to plates and you're like, all right. It's like, oh, that, that, that was quick. We were waiting the whole movie for this. Yeah, I want my heroes in hamster balls walking over water. Yeah. Who doesn't want that? 
yeah, like I, I would definitely want to keep the the bubble thing there. I would keep um, you know the steed look with the the, the sword and the umbrella, um, and maybe have like a few like little tricks and gadgets built into the bowler hat in some sort of capacity. If there's nothing built into the bowler hat, it is a waste of a bowler hat. It honestly is. What's the point? What's the goddamn point? I, 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 I do love in the movie that he is given shit for always carrying an umbrella, and then at one point in the the climax, Sean Connery like vaporizes all of the glass. Not vaporizes, but like shatters all the glass and comes tumbling down. You're like, oh, well, he's got an umbrella. He's fine. You kind of feel like it's going to be a, a moment to like justify his umbrella, but then somehow he just gets knocked over and covered in glass anyways. Like, oh, well, th- why, why even have this? Oh, it turns out he can't be anywhere without his sword. Yeah, I was like, oh, come on. If you're going to have an umbrella, use the umbrella. Yeah, I, I do like the idea of only the bad guys using guns and the good guys coming up with all these other different things. Yeah. I think that's kind of fun. I think we can stick with that because yeah. these are the sorts of movies that, that glamorize gun violence. And uh, I'd say the less guns in this movie, the better. I would agree with that as well. Yeah. And I like, would happily glamorize hat violence. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you could even, you know, stash a blade in the room of the hat, all a goldfinger if you wanted to, you know, yeah, I, I feel like it. this is the sort of, story where you could throw in those kind of little nods and winks and if it's done the right way it would play well yeah or and it's like just a steel plated thing like a crazy safe falls from the sky and it crashes on the hat and just falls off because it's so well protected oh yeah it's like a hard hat built into it it's like a, yeah it's like a titanium uh titanium bowler hat i'm, I'm here for it i want one now actually <laughs> yeah, I, I i feel like it's the fashion accessory we all need yeah in these I'm crumbling right. times yeah uh, you know, you just like stitch a mask into the front of it and you're good to go. It's very relevant. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what other things we need. Cause we kind of have like our core plot elements. We kind of have the, the shape of the story and what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I, what other pieces I, are we missing? What other set pieces do we need? I think you could keep in some way the, like the Escher style house set piece. Mm-hmm. I think you just have to find an in universe justification for it. Like either they're, poisoned and go on some sort of like weird acid trip or you know they're you know mind manipulated with like a um, like, like a mind control device or like something like psychedelic or something like that like you, you need to set up that they are affected by something and that that's why it, it throws into question their perception rather than it just somehow being this weird house that can do this sort of thing yeah i um, agree with that it like th- to me that was one of the most interesting aspects of the movie to the point where like, I was really thinking about that a lot. And if I, I like where this is going, I think this works better. But at one point I was considering like a super low budget version that was going to be more or less like a, like a locker room murder mystery sort of thing mm-hmm. as a possibility. Um, focusing solely on that. But I think you could just use that as like a set piece somewhere in there. And otherwise yeah. give it a bit of a scale. I mean, I, I would also set that up as this person who's able to kind of like build, like literally an MC Escher villain is the villain that you could tease in this movie that then you would then use in the sequel. Mm, yeah, that's true. It's like this weird incongruous thing that doesn't necessarily fit in your movie. And it's a cool set piece. And then, but then you, like, when you think about it, like what? And then that's the, the post credit sting of figuring out like this MC Escher villain is what's going to be the next threat. Yeah. Cause that's I think cool. one of the other things we haven't figured out is how are they taking the villains down? Because lightning from the sky hanging wire clip battle and oh good the hot air balloon exploded i don't think you're gonna work no so what do, what do we need uh... I, I i feel like the bailey character needs to get like uh, his car goes off a cliff the eddie Izzard character dies and then we find out that he wasn't really the, the real villain i feel like that's a smaller death and then we're done with him yeah, yeah. like uh, i said this is the one area that i really struggled with coming up with how to make it work um, was like how to flesh out the the beats of the villain stuff. Really, I would say Sir August de Winter. I feel like we can make Ice Nine actually works better since that's his last name. I feel like we can make his death slightly tragic. Mm-hmm. Of he he like everything is going well, but then like the, systematically getting taken down, and then literally everyone shows up and it has him cornered, and he's going to lose. And he's like, well, I'm not going into custody. And then he drinks some of the Ice Nine. Ooh. He turns to ice and then shatters. Ooh, that'd be good. That'd be a cool visual, too. Yeah. 
And that way you can kind of have the, it, he, he's the cause of his own undoing in the same way that, uh, like, it literally, it could be a vial that he had around his neck this whole time. And like, oh no, he's got ice nine. What's he going to do? And he drinks it. And then, but for father, if that's someone who is interested in power and is going after power, that's where it gets too much power and then like turns like literally that that's a case where this big quest for power and then get that father needs to be the one that goes to jail. Yeah. And I would say that if you're going to like uh, splinter off your, your heroes to fight your villains, I think more interesting to have Emma Peel fight with the, the main villain, the August of winter character, because like they're the two scientists, like they're the ones who actually know what they're doing. Like it makes more sense to send yeah, off to deal with him. And then I think it makes more sense for Steve to deal with the mole because that's a little more personal to him. Like his whole life is built around this organization and to have a, and father could literally be the person who recruited him. Yeah, exactly. Make it a little bit personal. So I feel like if you're going to do this sort of like swashbuckling sword fight sort of thing, like make that happen there. Like you're more traditional, like, um, like fist yeah, cup sort of thing happens between those two. Yes, I a hundred percent agree with that. And then once Steed wins, can go help uh, Peel, who was just about to lose, but then the two of them together take down August de Winter, mm-hmm. and then Ice Explosion. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that works for me. I don't. Well, I don't know what else we're missing now at this point. Okay, um... I'll, give, I'll give you one more thing. What is a crazy gadget that you think would belong in this movie that isn't in this movie yet? Uh, the bowler hat dispenses tea. It's not just the car. Oh, man. Okay, good. Perfect. Done. <laughs> I love it. Or, or maybe like the, the umbrella dispenses tea, but I like the idea of throwing in get another tea dispenser. And then the, the tie is just a series of stacked tea bags. Literally, yeah, exactly. you break off the piece. You take the tie, break off the end, put the tie back in, and then just the tie yeah. was the tea bag the whole time. Because I, I, there, that was one recurring gag that I did appreciate, which is the constant need to take a tea break. But I, I think the the way you make that work though is you have Steed always being the one that wants to take the tea break, and you have to have Emma being like, "Really? Now a tea break?" Yeah. And then like at the end, you can like flip it on its head or whatever. Like they've recovered from the mission, the everything's blown up, and they've escaped, and you're just like, "Oh, should we have some tea?" <laughs> Good. I like it. Yeah. And cut the macaroons, because the weird way Mother ate that macaroon out of the oh. assistant's hands was the creepiest thing. Just, just no. No, no, no. It hard pass. Hard, hard, hard pass. Yeah. All right, cool. So do you want to get into casting? Yes. Yeah. Um, right. This is... I spent so much time trying to run through a long list of people, because for me, it was really about casting the pair. It's ultimately what I had to make the most sense of casting the pair. So I, I still have a long list. And as I've been thinking through it, I think I've kind of narrowed it down to who I want to go with. Cool. Um, but I feel like for John Steed, my thinking is you need to have someone who's like late 30s. Like someone who has been doing this for a little bit of a while, um, feels established. Um, I agree know, with that. Yeah, has to be British, obviously. Has to be, you know, like very, very charming. Look good in a suit. But has to have like a little bit of quirk i think i think that's really critical like again this sort of thing where it's like you are drawn to this person and charismatic but you can also very easily just be like you're kind of a goof and i don't really know what your deal is so i have a (laughs) a long long list here but the name that just kept sticking in my brain and so i think i'm going to go with it on this is matt smith oh interesting okay yes i was Uh, gonna look it up and i'm like i know who matt smith is yeah matt smith so former doctor from doctor who matt smith um also in the crown which to be fair i have been watching recently which is why he stopped my brain but i I do feel like he could fit into that role very well like he would look good in a suit he would look good in a bowler hat he is very charming he has like a sense of intelligence behind him a little bit but he's a little bit quirky and he can have a little bit of an edge too, which is what I picked up on in the crown. Like he definitely yeah. plays a bit of an asshole in that. And I think all of those things were very necessary for him. And he's, you know, kind of the, the right age I was looking for. Um, Cause he's 38. So I think he's kind of right around the age that would make sense for that character. I agree with that. I think that's a good choice. Yeah. Um, my choice is I wanted someone who's kind of done the dark, but also kind of like has done the, the, a little bit more lighter characters and has experience being in these larger worlds, the sci-fis, the fantasies Mm -hmm. and has, has played kind of buffoonish a little bit, but also is capable of cleaning up very well. 
And so I went with uh, Riz Ahmed. Oh, um, I do love Riz Ahmed. Yeah. Oh. In Nightcrawler and Rogue One and Venom. And like, you can see that guy in a suit. And yeah. also it's <laughs> the movie, it's British. So it's very white. So I was going through and trying to find a little bit of uh, uh, diversity for mm-hmm. a couple of different characters. And this is one of the places I did that um, was let's make the lead not white. Yeah. Or one of them, at least. I don't know what you did for uh, Peel. But that that's what, but again, I agree, and it's all about the pair. So regardless of who we end up with, we can't really cast them individually. It's going to be how they work together. Mm-hmm. So I think those are two good choices for John Steed. Yeah. So let me tell, I have a backup for Emma Peel, too, just in okay. case. The person who I have for Dr. Mrs. Peel is someone, the biggest thing that I remember from the first time I watched this movie is of, Oh, well, they, Uma Thurman's very pretty and they put her in a bunch of pretty things. So you need mm-hmm. someone who looks good in pretty things, but is also incredibly competent, who you instantly trust knows what she's talking about and who might be evil. We're not quite sure yet, but mm-hmm. uh, we're, we're going to see. And so it felt like the obvious choice for this was Natalie Dormer. Oh, I do like Natalie Dormer a lot. Yeah, she would be really, really good. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, that is a good show. And has done action stuff, so that's true. Hard she stuff. has. Yeah. yeah, my backup for this was Hannah Simone, but I think I prefer Natalie Dormer. Uh, do I... Hannah Simone is uh, the other woman from uh, New Girl. Oh, oh, oh yeah, my she, god! She's a good choice, and like she's uh, the person who's going to be the new. Um, Oh no, I don't oh, yeah. think this went. The, I think she was supposed to be the, the new greatest American hero. Yeah, but then that didn't go, and also who knows what's happening right now. Yeah, that's true. But, that's very, very but true. It's like, if they thought she was going to be good for greatest American hero, then that's kind of good for this too, which is why I had her as a backup. But I don't know. Natalie Dormer always, got, always has a secret. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, she has a little bit of like, oh, can we trust her sort of thing. Yeah, which um, was kind of fun. But who'd you have for uh, uh, Mrs. Dr. Peel? I, I had I had a long list here and again like I've been I just have them all written out and I've been trying to like get a sense of where I want to go like so the the name that I have that I still really like although I feel I feel like it's an oddball choice and I feel like there would be I love oddball choices backlash because she's not like you know you don't think of her as like wearing a cat suit and being like you know super hot sort of thing but I genuinely really love her. And so you won't necessarily recognize the name. You'll probably recognize some of the role she's played. So, but her name is Kirby Howell Baptiste. So if you've seen The Good Place, she was Simone, who was the um, who was Chidi's colleague in Australia. And then she also had a small role in Killing Eve as Elena, as um, like one of the other like MI6 operatives. But I I kind of wanted someone who is hasn't like she is beautiful, but she also has like a natural sense of comedy to her a little bit because i feel like when this world being so ridiculous you can't have someone play deadpan off of steve i think is the reason that this movie fails so miserably is that um i don't think uma thurman knew what to do i think you need someone who is gonna have a little bit that rises of humor of like hanging a lampshade on everything in terms of how ridiculous it is but you can also believe is actually like smart and capable um And I feel like she maybe doesn't totally fit tonally with the direction we've gone with it now, but she to me was the most interesting. I mean, I had a long, long, long list. I tried to stick to people who I had seen enough of their work to recognize like what their talents would be. Um, you know, cause I had like some more obvious choices to be like a, like a Jodie Comer who's great in Killing Eve yeah. um, or Vanessa Kirby, who I think is excellent. I think would be really good, but she's already done Mission Impossible. She's like a, a very prominent role in Mission Possible Fallout. She has a recurring role in the next two movies. I kind of feel like she was kind of written out at this point. Um, yeah, so it's it's a weird choice. But that's what I'm going with. Uh, Kirby Hal Baptiste. I like that. I think that's a really good choice. And then and... to your point, it adds a little bit of diversity. And I, I kind of wanted, I did kind of want the, the Steed character. I, I wasn't casting it specifically with him being white. I had a lot of um, actors call in there too. But one of the things I liked is the idea that, you know, he maybe represents to some degree kind of like the old guard a little bit. And then there's this new person yeah. coming in who like represents kind of a more um, 
modern progressive take, which actually that was like one of the big things about the show back in the sixties was that Steed was, you know, kind of like this representative of like old Britain and his, his uh, colleague, whether it was Anna Rigg or honor Blackman or, or a few other people they brought in always represented a more younger modern person. I felt like that uh, Kirby was just that bit. So I like it. If it were me, I would say we should go with Riz Ahmed and, uh, Kimberly uh, Hal Baptiste. Oh, Kirby Hal Baptiste. Yeah, Kirby Hal Baptiste. Yeah. We do it. We do those two. Would that work? Mm-hmm. I think that's a fun pairing. I think they would be good. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that they would have fun playing off of each other. Y- you could see Riz Ahmed like having to like. You could see him playing that fine line of like being kind of like flapped. If I don't know what the opposite of unflappable is, I'm just going to keep using the word flapped. Being flapped. I think flapped is the correct word, and anyone who says otherwise is a liar. Exactly. I I could see him like being flapped by Kirby's sort of um, kind of like bubbly energy a little bit, but also still having to maintain this air of being unflappable. And I think that sort of um, friction and chemistry could be really fun. I agree. I think that's yes. I agree. I agree completely. Uh, cool. I love that. Uh, let's talk about Sir August de Winter. I can go first for this one. Yeah, so I don't really have much here. So Mine's a little bit of stunt casting, but also kind of fun and playing with the idea of who it used to be. Because mm-hmm. you kind of need someone who even could have been like the old, well, he, th- this guy used to be like the big popular like action hero, but now he's older and like, but like really he settled into the science of all this and it's crazy and everything, but also has a little bit of, tinge of comedy because we've seen this guy do comedy before and it was funny and i think for the role of sir august de winter what i want is liam neeson Ooh, i really like that because I, I will be honest i i was struggling on this one because i also didn't have a really distinct vision in my mind of who the villain would be it was more just like how to make tonally this all work absolutely um so I, at one point i thought like well maybe timothy dalton <laughs> <laughs> but I that might be a bit too on the nose. I mean that that would be really funny. Yeah. The the only other person I was considering was um this actor Alistair Petri Petrie, who have you seen Sex Education on Netflix? No, but I've heard the name of this actor actor. Yeah, before. it's a great show. He plays the, the the head of the school in that, and he also has a uh, like a small supporting role as one of the this like the stern general in Star Wars Rogue One. Yeah. Um, but he has this sort of like you know stern demeanor but has an air of comedy to him but i i agree with you i think a bigger name you could throw in here the better and i, I think the liam neeson thing would be um pretty fun cool i love it then who do you have for uh, who do you have replacing eddie izzard as bailey i'll be honest i i didn't have anybody but um i think okay I, okay go I, ahead i think i just came up with the name off the top of my head but <laughs> all right so I went with someone who can kind of match Eddie Izzard in terms of like uh, flamboyishness, but also is very popular and I think would be fun to hear them talk. And also is a well-known actor. It, it's very popular right now. And I feel like the correct choice for the character of the the <laughs> the fabulous thug is Noel Fielding. Oh, wait, I think I, I'm pretty sure. Wait, is, is he... He's um, one Mighty of the, Boosh. Yeah, Mighty Boosh, IT Crowd, uh, one of the new hosts, or one of the, yeah, hosts on uh, Great British Bake Off. I wholeheartedly agree. I cool. I love him. Um, his his supporting role in the IT Crowd, I think, is still just one of the funniest characters. Um, no, I agree. The, the name that came to mind, as I was having a couple of people on the spot, was Matt Barry, who also was in the IT Crowd. Yeah. Um, but I feel like he might be a bit too much um, i feel like he'd be a good like villain i don't think he'd be a very good thug yeah um like have you, have you watched uh, what we do in the shadows the tv oh show? yeah i love he's, it the, he's so so my, good that. my submission for the nickelodeon fellowship this year where we had to write a spec episode of something i wrote a spec episode of what we do in the shadows oh my god yes it's brilliant it, i love that show that show is genuinely the best comedy currently on television i would wholeheartedly agree <laughs> it's, i love it uh, but no, I think you're right. No fielding is the way to go. Cool. Then that brings me to mother. 
this was fun for me coming up with some of these different characters because I've been watching like my quarantine like viewing has all been like British panel shows and things. So like mm-hmm. just trying to find British comedians, I'm like, I know who to get for this. And like it's it's been fun because I've been watching uh, a lot of Taskmaster, which I know uh, your podcasting partner Cameron really likes. Oh, okay. And it's perfect and wonderful. And the season with Noel Fielding is a really, really, really good season. And Noel mm-hmm. is like surprisingly capable and competent at just about everything. Yeah, I love it. But that's where I found uh, that. That's where I found my casting for Mother as well. Not from Taskmaster necessarily, but okay. He's a British stand-up. I think I know you're going to say it, but go ahead. He, I don't think you do. Uh, Dara O'Brien. Then nope, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh dara o'brien is irish um or i think irish i hope i'm doing i mean it's an o but i i i I make assumptions but i don't know like background and how naming things right works aka dara o'brien nicknamed dobby or penis sausage (laughs) i'm not sure why that's there fantastic but yeah university of dublin irish super irish okay uh, but he he hosts a show called Mock the Week. He just he's a very funny stand up, and I support and vote for him. That is a, a good call. I thought you were going to say Stephen Fry. Oh no, uh, he's my Invisible Jones. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I don't know if you cast Invisible Jones, but I'm like I, it has I, to be Stephen Fry. I I honestly I didn't really do a lot of the supporting characters. I I did Steed and Emma because I felt like the whole thing really like hung on those two. So I did those two, and then um. I spent so much time trying to figure out the plot. And so then my other big thing was like focusing <laughs> on like directors and writers, which was like matching. Yeah. Characters. So I had like a creative staff and the two main leads. And that was kind of like where the most of my focus went. Um, okay. Then, uh, then let me, so that's invisible Jones. Let me talk about my father and my Alice. Okay. And then we'll, and then we'll get to writer and director when you'll be, when you'll have a little bit more. Okay. Uh, so my father is, uh, an actress who was on Dr. Who she's in Mary Poppins returns. She's, was in the undoing black earth rising she's an actress named uh noma dumezweni hmm don't I'm, I'm sure we'll recognize her but i don't know yeah she was someone who i recognized but i was like i've seen her in things but i don't know what things oh okay yeah okay i know who you're talking about so i just thought she'd be fun no i agree with that okay i like this yeah yeah cool and then my Alice, the only person who was an actual competent secret agent, uh, is, as long as I'm casting people with N names, Nora Armani, who is an older actress who was in, I don't know, she is, uh, uh, but she's in Casualty, she's in Blacklist Redemption, she's in something called Good Funk. She's Mediterranean, uh, Middle Eastern, Caucasian. I, I don't know. I just thought she'd be an interesting choice. She's a little bit of an older actress, not really as well known. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, think, I think it's a good thing to do is to throw in like a little bit of a lesser known yeah. character here. Let this lesser known character be epic for a minute. Yeah. I'm here for it. So, yeah. Just thought that'd be fun. So that brings me to writer and director. Okay. So uh, let's start with writer and tell me who you got. Okay. So I, when I was trying to figure out how to make this work, I was thinking, okay, it's, it's surreal, right? And uh, I initially was actually kind of thinking of approaching this, like I mentioned the idea of doing like a locked room, locked room murder mystery sort of thing. So I was kind of almost approaching it like a bit of a horror POV. And we, we've kind of veered away from that. Um, Fair. But I still think this could possibly, possibly work. And I was trying to think of, okay, who can do surreal, but can also be very British? <laughs> <laughs> And so I actually went with Charlie Brooker of Black Mirror fame. So the creator of uh, Black Mirror. I, I think choice. he's gone a slightly more comedic route um, than I originally had envisioned. So I don't know what his comedy chops are. I feel like there's not a lot of comedy really in Black Mirror. It's mostly pretty bleak. Um, Charlie Brooker is an English humorist. Critic, author, screenwriter. Like literally the first thing oh. under his name is humorist. Well, and, then I guess that worked out better than I thought it would. <laughs> yeah, he's he's done other comedy stuff. I don't necessarily have anything uh, in mind, but <laughs> he was on Nevermind the Buzzcocks. Funny. He just felt like, I felt like you needed to have a a pretty big name attached to try and make this work. Like, given yeah. the fact that the last one was such a, a notorious flop and Correct. disaster, you kind of needed someone who, like, you'd be like, oh, I think they could do an interesting job with this. That's why I went with him. 
yeah, I think that's a good choice. Um, also, uh, last time we did Bond, we already said Phoebe Waller Bridge. I was like, ah, shit. I yeah. Can't, I can't steal from ourselves again. <laughs> True. Uh, my writer is someone, was one of the writers on Kingsman, because yes, it so mm-hmm. perfectly matches this in terms of tone, but she also was a writer on Kick-Ass, X-Men First Class, oh. Stardust, and was the writer for Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. So in terms of like weird, other Tony kind of things. So I went with uh, Jane Goldman. That is a great, great choice, actually. Yeah, no, she's a phenomenal writer. I love her stuff. Yeah, and again, I think this is a situation where we need to have both the the two leads i think we need to figure out a writer and director who will work well together mm-hmm. so two good options for writer let's uh let's talk about director you went first for writer let me tell you about my director all right this guy hasn't actually done all that much but he's a british director who worked on agent carter which i think even though it's american kind of fits like the secret agent but weird sci-fi kind of tones of what i figured yeah. we'd end up with. he also has directed outlander a show called britannia and his name is Metin uh, Hussein, M-E-T-I-N-H-U-S-E-Y-I-N. All right, yeah, I'm looking at his stuff here. Oh, okay, yeah, I know he's done some good stuff. Yeah, um, I don't think his, he's quite as big a name as who we should probably go with for this, for exactly the reason that you just said, of this mm-hmm. is a notorious flop. But I think that it's someone, it's like, if he's someone who's kind of on his way up, this would be the sort of thing. Yeah, and, and but, I think if you... you put him with a you know a pretty big cast and a well-known writer it could probably work i agree but that was kind of like my british left field choice um mm. my, my backup was an american guy i'm like but we can't have an american director for this no no, no we can't we just can't no, absolutely not even if he did work on pushing daisies <laughs> uh i'm sorry go ahead who do you have for uh, director uh so again i was trying to think of okay we need someone british um, and I was trying to think of like what is some of the best, the, what is some of the best British content that's been coming out of the last few years, and I feel like we need someone who can approach this with sincerity. Actually, I think is one of the things that has to work. I think this movie was very tonally inconsistent. I think you need to bring in someone who can bring um, like a really sincere and consistent tone. And it's a slightly odd choice. But I'm going with the uh, director of Paddington 1 and Paddington 2, Paul King. <laughs> okay. I, I will say that those movies have some interesting action sequences. They do. Like, I look, I love both those movies. I, le- I they're so good. I will legitimately sit and argue with someone that Paddington 2 should have been nominated for Best Picture of the Year it came out. Like, that is such... <laughs> Like, that is, for what it is, my definition of a good movie is, does it know what it wants to be and does it succeed? And that movie knows exactly what it wants to be. It completely succeeds. It is absurdly charming. Um, <laughs> and I just feel like he, Kumi has the chops. Like, he has the talent and he's got a very, you know, clear vision. And I feel like this would be a, just enough of a tonal shift for him that he could do something really fantastic with it. Say his name again? Paul King. What other than the Paddington movies has he done? Okay, so he has done some other stuff with TV. Uh, worked with the Noel Mighty Boosh. Yes, exactly. The Mighty Boosh worked with No Fielding before. So he's done that. Um, a little bit of Little Britain. He did a couple episodes of Space Force, which I, I watched a couple episodes I didn't quite get into. But um, and apparently he's attached to do a new version of Willy Wonka. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at right now. Like, you want someone who can handle something weird and otherworldly. Willy Wonka's a good comp for that. Yeah, it is, actually. Yeah, I didn't didn't know he was attached to that. Um, Yeah, Space Force, by the way, is a bad example. (laughs) Yes, Um, that that show just didn't didn't work. I gave it two episodes, and I was like, ah, no. no. But I think think this is a great pick. I think we should go with Paul King for our director. I, yeah, I think Paul King, but I think Jane Goldman. I think put Jane Goldman on it with Paul King. I feel like those two could make some magic. I think um, I agree with that. And if we want to go one step further, I would say um, attach Matthew Vaughn as a producer and do the Sumar films. They're the ones who do Kingsman. Great. I love it. Just because, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a similar-ish territory, but I feel like it's just different enough. Um, and I think the team he has over there is pretty solid. And he works with Jane Goldman all the time. So. And you want him attached as a producer? A producer, yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm cool with that. Yeah, I think that's a fun idea. I think we have our movie. I think so. All right, let me take you through uh, our cast and, right. and 
see what we got. So the Avengers, but British. <laughs> John Steed will be uh, Riz Ahmed. Dr. Mrs. Emma Peel will be Kirby Howell Baptiste. Sir August de Winter will be Liam Neeson. Bailey will be Noel Fielding. Mother will be Dara O'Brien. Father will be Noma Dumezweni. Uh, Invisible Jones will be Stephen Fry. Alice will be Nora Armani. All of this will be written by Jane Goldman and directed by Paul King with Matthew Vaughn to help produce. And that is The Avengers. I'd watch it. Yeah, I mean... I still, I, like, I've recommended that people watch the original one, but at, like, it's the perfect bad movie night kind of movie. Yeah. But don't watch it alone. <laughs> no, don't watch it alone. Because I, I'm a huge advocate for the, um, the good bad movie. Oh, yeah. Like, I will go to the grave saying that I would much rather sit down and watch Batman and Robin than I would The Dark Knight Rises under pretty much all circumstances. Because um, to me, that's... I would agree. Sh- I've never seen Batman and Robin. <gasps> it's look it's stupid but it I, is I, I, it sounds up my alley i've just never it's just never happened yet yeah it's it's dumb but it's fun um but, you know it, it's it's a ride it's a fun ride like i i much prefer a bad or excuse me a good bad movie to a bad good movie which is what i consider the dark knight rises to be like a movie that was made with all intents and purposes to be like very serious and like prestige but ultimately just like kind of falls apart and it's boring and long and it's three hours. Is that hours the one with Thurman or is that the one with, uh, 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 and Arnold Schwarzenegger? Or is that the one with Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones? So Batman forever is the one with Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones. So Uma okay. Thurman's a Batman and Robin. Yeah. Good I, I, bad I, I think Avengers is like a bad, bad movie, but you're right. If you watch it with other people and you can like poke fun at it along the way and just sit there and be like, why the fuck are they dressed as teddy bears? Then it works. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But no, I, I would watch our version with the, the hope that it would actually be pretty good. I got a good feeling yeah. about it. Knock on wood, I guess. I mean, look, <laughs> there's nowhere to go but up. This is true. Yes. But Chris, uh, why don't you tell everybody uh, about where they can find you on the internet and about your two, three podcasts? Uh, yeah, so uh, I have a podcast called Tim Talk, named after uh, Bruce Tim, who co-created Batman in its series. So it's Tim with two N's, J-M-M. Um, but my co-host Cameron and I uh, talk all things the DC animated universe. Uh, Sam has been on before, which was a delight. You were a guest, and right? I was, yeah, a couple okay. of times. And you remember the one that I want to come back for, right? Legends. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I have it I have it in my notes. I'm. I honestly like... I forget the episodes as soon as we finish them. So I sometimes I go like, did I make that up that you were a guest on there? No, I was a guest twice. <laughs> That's right, you were. Okay. I, I, I was a guest for Almost Got Him, and then I was a guest for uh, the Mr. Mix, Miss Pick. Oh, Missy's Pick Look. Okay, that's right. Yeah, but it's all about the DC Anime Universe, and Sam has been a guest a, a couple of times. And uh, <laughs> so we, we, we talk about that. We are just about ready to wrap up our run on Static Shock. Uh, and then from there, we're moving on to Justice League, which I'm very, very excited about. And Sam has already earmarked an episode to come on as a guest. And I, I have Yay. not forgotten this time because I did forget last time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do that. I also have another podcast called Gay at Ford, where I learn how to be a better gay uh, because I am a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, uh, that might not make sense to some people. Do you want to give an <laughs> example of an episode? So the, the the whole idea behind it is that I didn't come out till I was 23, but I didn't even really get a chance to like be a part of a, you know, a gay culture until 26 is which then I moved to LA. Um, and so like, I was just so disconnected from like a lot of the stereotypes, but also a lot of the nuances of just kind of the, the queer space. And so this is a chance for me to go and learn a lot about it. So it's either we're, you know, I'm watching movies like, um, Death Becomes Her or, um, you know, Thanks for everything, or Tu Wong Fu, thanks for everything, Julie Newmar. Or I'm interviewing friends of mine who have a totally different queer experience. Like, uh, I've had a couple of friends on who are both trans. And so, you know, trying to get a sense of, like, what it's like to be queer um, outside of just the way I've perceived it in the past. Um, but that's another fun one. So that's the uh, the other podcast to do. And I have some more in the works, but uh, not ready to announce those quite yet. So Fair. Sounds yes. good. And yeah. Uh, and then if you want to find me directly, uh, I am uh, at Lord of Her on Twitter and Instagram. Great. Uh, if you're interested in finding me on Twitter, I'm at Sam Gash, S-A-M-G-A-S-C-H. Or you can find uh, the podcast itself, which is on Instagram, but that's also kind of me, which is 
Ideal Remake on Instagram, um, or you can join us on Facebook, which is Ideal Remake or Ideal Remake Podcast, and that would be great. Or tell you what, this would make for a crazy afternoon. Go on Apple Podcasts and leave us a five star review. That would be wonderful, and it would be incredibly helpful. And that's how people uh, kind of can find the show. So if you do that, you're a you're a peach. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, we made it. We made a movie, Chris. How do you feel? I feel great. I, I, like I said at the top of the show, I had no idea what to do with this until like a few tonal pieces started to fall into play. Most of the men in black thing. Once yeah. I like, landed I, on that, I was like, okay, I, I know how men, to go with this now. Yeah, that was the right thing. So then we will end with this. What is your favorite quote from the movie, The Avengers? I can't remember one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, I have blocked it all out. Let's just go with uh, T. I understood that reference. Yes.